the topic of the day is called Applied Optimization, which makes it sound much fancier than it actually is. is. So what the textbook means when it says applied optimization is that it wants you to find maxes and mins, but with some kind of story problem attached to it. And applied optimization problems can be straightforward. Applied optimization problems can require a lot of work. It all depends on what information we're given, what information we need, and whether or not we have a formula to work with. So let's start on the kind of more straightforward side of things. And because, I mean, at this, this is ordinarily the point where I'd be like lecturing, okay, here's how to do it. But we already know that, um, I mean, we've already learned how to find maxes and mins, so it's not like there's really any new technique to learn here. We'll just dive into an example, commenting as we go. So, Drug concentration will be our first example. It's a nice sort of real world example. Doesn't require a lot of obscure background to talk about. So there's no, I mean, there's no one-size-fits-all rule with mathematical modeling. I'm not going to say that this is some kind of absolute, but a lot of times drug concentrations can be modeled with an equation that looks like this. And what do I mean drug concentrations? I mean, what's X? Well, we're giving a patient a dose of a drug, and X is the amount of time since the dose was administered. And let's say for simplicity that X is measured in hours, although in the real world the unit of time is going to vary from drug to drug. I mean, some drugs you might take and they're supposed to be effective over the course of the entire day. In the case of an accidental poisoning, it might be more urgent. X might be measured in minutes. But let's just say that X is measured in hours here. And C of X is the percent per volume of the drug in the patient's bloodstream. 
and again. I'm not saying this is some kind of 100% one size fits all rule, but the graphs of these functions look like this. And that graph really does sort of satisfy our intuition about what a concentration function should be doing, right? There's initially no blood, no drug in the bloodstream. The drug suffuses through the patient's body. The drug is purged from the patient's body. So this is a pretty realistic type of equation. The A, the B, and the C depend on real world factors. So I mean, that depend on the drug, first of all. Not all drugs spread identically through the body. Then they might depend on the patient's body weight, the sex of the patient, how hard the patient is, has exercised or is exercising. Just a bunch of factors like this. So say for a certain patient and a certain drug, we know what these A, B, and C are. Maybe C of X equals 0 0.2 times X divided by 3X squared plus 1. And we ask, when will the drug concentration reach maximum value. And the way I state this problem, I make it sound so simple. I mean, we found all of these extremas already. We had two different quizzes on finding various extremas. What you're actually going to see in a lot of real world situations like this one, is that the techniques that the textbook, and by proxy, me, but the techniques you get presented in class don't exactly or don't perfectly work. And you need to be a little flexible. And very often, you cannot get textbook authors to admit this because textbook authors are scared of technology for some reason, but very often we are going to end up creating a graph. Here's the problem. I mean, here's sort of the issue that this example is presenting us. What do we want? Well, we want the absolute maximum, right? 
I mean, suppose we ask this problem, and suppose try to just clear your mind. Suppose I haven't already told you what C of X looks like. And maybe, maybe C of X looks like this. And there is no absolute maximum. That could happen, right? The only time we know there's an absolute maximum, well, I'm sort of getting ahead of myself. All I'm saying for now is we want an absolute maximum. I mean, there's a local maximum here, but if our goal is to find where the drug concentration is at its greatest, that local maximum is not what we're looking for. We're looking for an absolute maximum. What we want and what we can easily find are sometimes two different things. So here's the complication. The technique we learned for finding Absolute Exedrema only works on closed intervals. And what's our closed interval supposed to be here? I mean, there's presumably a minimum dosage. The minimum dosage you could give is zero. You could just not administer the drug. But it's not clear from the information we are given. Wait, sorry, I am conflating. There's a, geez, one of those days. Okay, I've sort of been conflating this problem and another problem. I was just talking about <coughs> minimum dosage. The dosage where we've given the patient's patient is fixed. I'm looking at time here, not dosage. So there's a minimum time. We can ask what happens zero seconds after the needle goes in. But there's not really a maximum time, right? We can ask how much drug is in the patient a day from now, a week from now, a year from now, at the moment of the patient's death. So we don't really have an upper bound. And it would probably make the most sense to think of the interval we're working on as just being from zero to infinity. <coughs> if we're on the interval from zero to infinity, we don't really know how to find an absolute maximum, though. So, this is what we want. This is a complication. I want to say the complication, 
but actually complication two the maximum might not exist. Again, we have this theorem, this extreme value theorem, but just like our technique only works on these intervals. Our theorem only works on these intervals. So we're trying to find this absolute maximum, but the absolute maximum might not exist. And if it does exist, we don't know how to find it. Stated like that, this problem seems very but this is why I said that very frequently we want to sort of go into these problems knowing what the graph looks like. And then we want to take the knowledge we get from the graph and we want to use it. Well, this is probably as good a time as any to ask if anybody has any questions about what's come so far. Then, let's see, Firefox, I think. Browser, least likely to spam me with political advertisements in my classroom. We'll go to Desmos and we'll take a look at this. Point two X divided by 3x squared plus 1. And let's see, we're seeing very little here, especially if they're kind of near the back. x is time, so x has to be positive. Let's go, y is not getting very big, but y has to be positive. So maybe y will go between 0 and 0.5. And now we can see this graph pretty clearly, and it is doing what I said on a previous frame, it should be doing. It is going up, hitting a maximum. Thus most will just tell us what the maximum is, but hitting a maximum and then going down. And I mean, I guess theoretically, it's always possible that the graph is going to look like this, and then at x equals a thousand, it's going to do something weird. But we can only say, you know, looking at the graph, X is in hours, so here's a week, here's about a month, here's about a year. I mean, it doesn't look like the graph is doing anything funny. It looks like the graph is going up, 
hitting a maximum and then just going down and getting closer and closer to zero. Which again, sort of matches our real world intuition, right? If I, I took Ritalin as a child, it's basically the drug I took in high school is basically out of my system at this point. So with this kind of, <coughs> let's default this. With this as our guide, both of our problems are kind of solved. We believe that a maximum exists because we're looking at the graph and we're seeing a maximum. And this maximum we're seeing is also a local maximum. So just from this graph, there should be a local maximum, maybe somewhere between zero and one, definitely somewhere between zero and two. So if we find this local maximum, that ought to be the absolute maximum that we're looking for. And in practice, this is how a lot of things kind of work out. We have a function we want to either maximize or minimize. We're not working on a closed interval, so we can't use the technique from 4.1. We graph it. We verify that what we're looking for exists. We verify that what we're looking for is also a local extrema. And then we use the local extrema techniques from 4.3 to find that local extrema. Any questions before we attempt to carry this out. We haven't used the quotient rule in some time. So this will be a bit of good review. So now we're looking for the local extrema of this function. And the reason I mentioned the quotient rule is that to find local extrema, we need to look at derivatives. And this is a quotient. It's, uh, it's got our numerator and our denominator. So we need the quotient rule, which let me see, it's been a while, but we're going to take the denominator and we're going to square it. Then in the top, okay, we've got a top, we've got a bottom. Take the derivative of the top. The derivative of 0.2x is 0.2. Leave the bottom alone. Then, leave the top alone and take the derivative of the bottom. Let's see, does this look right to everyone so far? 
then what we've got to do is, I mean, we want to know where this thing equals a zero. We're just setting this equal to zero without doing any kind of simplification is not going to be a fun time. We really had better try to do something about this. So what can we do? Well, this point two will distribute. Multiplication distributes over addition. So let's see. Let's see if we can avoid making any goofy mistakes here. 0.2 times 3 is 0 0.6. 0 0.2 times 1 is 0 0.2. 0 0.2 times 6 is... Uh, 1.2, right? Oh, divided by this denominator, 3x squared plus 1. Squared. These local extrema can occur when the, this is equal to zero. Isn't the 1.2 supposed to be x squared? You might well be right. You are exactly right. Thank you for catching that. So, um, stuff then simplifies a little more. I mean, 0.6x squared minus 1.2x squared. That should be 0.2 minus 0.6x squared over this denominator equals zero. Everyone buy this so far? Questions, comments, concerns? This looks worse than it is. I mean, 3x squared plus 1 squared is just some positive number, right? I mean, 3x squared is positive, 1 is positive, we take this number, we square it. Although positive and negative, it doesn't really matter. The only point I'm trying to make is that we can multiply both sides by the denominator of this fraction. And doing that, this, what, But just a few seconds ago might have looked like a very formidable bit of algebra simplifies into this quadratic. We can add point six x squared to both sides. We can divide, let's see, 0.2 divided by 0.6, one third. And this has two solutions, actually. There 
appear to be two candidates. Well, in reality, only one of those makes any sense, right? X has to be positive. It doesn't make sense to ask what happens negative the square root of one-third hours after the drug was administered. So, of the two answers, only one makes sense. Let's see. The square root of one third is point five seven seven. And I think, in one sense, I think it would make sense to say, okay, this problem is done. And like, in a lot of real world situations, I just end it there. Because I mean, what, what do we know? We, we know from the grand that this maximum we're looking for exists and is somewhere near 0.5. So we were looking for a critical value somewhere near 0.5. And we found a critical value at 0.577. It's kind of open and shut in one sense. But maybe um, we'll take this opportunity to verify using the first derivative test that this really is a local maximum. And the first derivative test is not, um, not really super difficult. I mean, our derivative, I shouldn't say that. I mean, it's easy for me to say something's not super difficult when I've been teaching this class for like half a decade. Um, but I mean, this first derivative test is just a matter of taking the derivative and plugging numbers into it. So whether or not it's difficult, it doesn't take a lot of time to describe. It's what I'd call straightforward. Um, so we could take zero and plug that in and we get a positive number. We get um, 0.2 if we let x be zero. If that's not obvious, I mean, you can of course go to your calculator and manually type in 0.2 minus 0.6 times zero squared divided by, and you will get a positive number. 